Today's guest on the What Fuels You podcast is Frank Mycroft. Frank is the co-founder and CEO of Booster, the leading mobile energy delivery platform that delivers fuels, including renewables, to fleets and consumers in the U.S. Prior to Booster, Mycroft worked as a rocket scientist for NASA and Boeing. He also served as the vice president of strategy for Planetary Resources, a robotics company that aspired to mine asteroids in space. Mycroft and colleagues Tyler Rao and Diego Neto founded Booster in 2014. Welcome, Frank. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. Good to see you. I'm going to hit you with some rapid fire to kick us off. You ready? Go for it. Okay. So is there a habit that you're trying to create right now? Yeah. Exercise every day. Um, Seven minutes every morning. Oh, the seven minute workout. I love that thing. You know, uh, muscle confusion, 30 seconds, 10 second break. It, I think it works. And that's what I have time for with three kids at home. Yeah. Well, and, and your business. It's so funny because I have this like thing in my head. I'm supposed to do an hour and the people that do seven minutes swear by it, but I'm convinced it doesn't work. So you'll have to let me know. Seven minutes is awesome. I saw something that was like, try to set your goals lower so you can achieve them and I think frequency is more important than duration I've seen. So yes. we'll give it a go. Yeah, the consistency of it. Okay, who is your hero? Like your lifelong hero? Ooh, um, the first person that comes to my mind has to be my mother. She immigrated from China, um, harrowing early day stories where her family lost their land. They had nothing. And yet somehow she immigrated to New York worked at a laundromat at the age of 16, somehow got into MIT just based off of her math skills. And then only person I know who works incredibly hard and doesn't ever think about herself. Oh my gosh. We, I definitely need to get into that story with you. That's an incredible, that I have chills. Seriously, working at a laundromat, getting into MIT. And, like, and back at a time, this was back when MIT was less than 5% female. So um, it very, I actually need to understand the story better myself because it almost seems impossible to me. It's a true American dream. Oh for yeah. An immigrant. Yeah. Maybe we'll have her on the podcast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, maybe this is the answer is the seven minute workout, but I'm curious what's the first thing you do in the morning when you start your day. It's probably the seven minute workout. Um, that's right after I make the coffee though, in the morning, I'm an absolute coffee addict, unfortunately. Yes. Okay, what's your special sauce as far as your skill set as a CEO? I think it's all about ideas and action. Um, this this desire to be creative and bring something new into the world and fight for it and be resilient um, is probably a, a superpower all entrepreneurs need. I agree. Yeah, and it's also hard. You can, it's not something you can necessarily teach. So you either have it or you don't. Um, what is something that you hate doing that you just want to avoid? Oh, uh, I don't know why taxes came to mind first, but <laughs> uh, just routine tasks that don't take creativity or mind share, but need to get done. Um, yeah. Always end up at the bottom of my list. Of course, not the things you want to do first. And when do you feel most productive? In the morning. Absolutely. I as I get older, I, I try more and more to go to sleep on time and wake up as early as I need to. That might be 5 a.m., 4 a.m. Oh, my start gosh. Start fresh. 4 a.m. Hey, the kids are asleep. Uh, you know, it's quiet at home. It's a good time wow. to work. That's impressive. That is incredibly impressive. Um, okay, Frank, last question. If there was a book written about your life, what would it be called? Ooh, um, I might call it the disillusioned astronaut <laughs> because that's how I really started my career. I wanted to be an astronaut and I decided that the conventional path was not the best path. I should go create something great in the world and build something tremendous that was that I was passionate about. And if getting into space was in the cards later in life, it would happen. But it, but you had to, you had to go find your own and forge your own path. 
Wow. It's funny because when we were little, you know, you always remember those kids of like, what did you want to be? And there were a handful that would say something like an astronaut. And it's almost like an eye roll, like, ha ha, who's going to actually do that? But you're one of the few people I'm like, look at this guy. I mean, your bio, we'll get into it. But I, I told you before we started recording, it's just incredibly impressive. And um, I'm curious who inspired you when you were little. You talked about your mom. So she went to MIT. Where did, where did she raise you? Well, and I do want to say though, Shauna, I, I am, I'm a bit bummed at the state of the world that if you ask kids today, they probably say they want to be a YouTube influencer, right? Oh God, or, that's so depressing. Uh, uh, so I, I yearn for the days when people wanted to be pilots or astronauts or authors or whatnot. Do you think that that's true? I've actually never processed it like this. I think the top three things are yeah, influencer and YouTube star. Oh, uh, no. That's it. Yeah, that's the aspiration of the, of the generation. Oh, gosh. Well, take me back to when you were little and you wanted to be an astronaut. When did you first discover space, I guess, and yeah, like just even I, wanting? Oh, my gosh. So, so many things. Um, the first was probably Star Trek, The Next Generation. I'm such a Star Trek fan, even over Star Wars, because in Star Trek, human beings have figured it out. Like, there's no war it's peace and it's knowledge and, and bettering ourselves. And I love that. And the, and diversity. Uh, I love that so much. And then I think chapter two was Carl Sagan. Mm, yes. Um, of course. Oh my gosh. Just his way with words and moving people about the pale blue dot and the fragility of it all and the beauty of it all. And then chapter three was, I got to work at NASA, uh, early on in college and get, I got to see the space shuttle launch in Cape Canaveral. So I remember sitting out there 2 a.m. in the morning, getting bitten by mosquitoes and watching this giant crawler crush the stone as it carried this giant rocket into space. Um, it's pretty special. Really special. And so where, where did your mom raise you? Did your parents raise you together? Yeah, like, my parents, you they raised me together. Um, they're both scientists. And I was one of the few people that I know in the Bay Area that was born in San Francisco um, to, to a couple of uh, scientists. Did you uh, go to Lowell? No. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like to... my smart San Francisco friends went to <laughs> Lowell. I'm like, are you a Lowell kid? No, I I was completely out of maybe the the smart kid Bay Area world. I was in Walnut Creek, it's where I grew mm, up. In the East Bay, Bay yeah. Uh, I had never heard of of the schools I went to to college, um, and I would have never. I, I'd say there was one person also who inspired me, a guy named Paul Scott, who was in my class in high school, who was just a math genius and. Uh, encouraged me to go to a math camp at Stanford at an early age. And I remember sitting in this minivan for a long commute to get there, but it was just getting surrounded by these people that were so brilliant, kind of opened a new world to me at an early yeah, age. The exposure. And so both of your parents are scientists and um, you were thinking about maybe being an astronaut and what, what do those steps look like? Was there a plan or was there anybody helping you along the way? Or did you kind of, you know, based on how you're speaking about it, it's almost like, how did you even discover Princeton? Yeah. I, I mean, it was, so first it was this math camp and I remember the smartest guy there wearing this hoodie <laughs> with a P on it. And ah. I, was, I was wondering, what is that? And that simple question kind of started the whole opening of, of the world. Um, I remember wanting to do engineering and just study hard things um, and actually becoming a pilot. I, I took the leap in early in college to get my pilot's license, which opened me up to a lot of different oh, wow. circles related to aerospace and- Do you and fly now? Path. Last time I flew an airplane was uh, in 20, I want to get this right, 2010 is when I proposed to my wife, actually. So I, I proposed to my wife on a flight and then- uh, A flight, then you, were, you, were, you were the pilot and oh my gosh, well, she must really love you to get in that plane. My, my plan was I, I flew my girlfriend at the time to an island, Catalina Island off the coast of LA. Wow. 
so she had limited options um, to to say yeah. to, uh, if she wanted an option to come home, you know, so that was uh, part of the plan. That's hilarious. I got engaged also on an airplane, um, oh. but a commercial flight. Yeah. That's so funny. Love it. It's a good place. It's a good place. Uh, so I, what, so you're, you were studying like, okay, to be a pilot, to be an astronaut, um, you know, I'm guessing you were probably really good in school, great in math because of your uh, college experience and also because you went to the Stanford math camp. Um, what else were you into? What would you like to do for fun? Oh, my gosh. I, I spent way too many hours in college in the basement of the engineering wing geeking out with electric trains when everybody else was having a good time, partying, all that good stuff. Uh, yeah. If I could go back, I probably would do things, uh, you know, spend more time with human beings. But I'll tell you the the thing I love the most about college, which I sometimes worry is getting lost in current society, was debates. Was having you know two a.m. in the morning debates with a, a sweet mate on controversial topics where we both had very different views. Maybe it was religion. Maybe it was healthcare politics. But we respected each other and we could debate and just go all night long. Um, that was really special. Yeah, I think broadly in society, it's definitely lost. Everyone's so fragile right now. Everyone's afraid to say the wrong thing. And people are just angry, I think, a lot. But finding your peeps that you can do that with, I think, is super energizing. And for me personally, I learned that's how I learn. I actually like to surround myself with people that have different opinions because I, I learn in that way, more than reading something, at least for me. You know, we had we had once a debate where we had the preeminent evolutionary biologist go up against a creationist. And, you know, it's something that I don't know if that kind of stuff happens anymore. But I learned more in an hour with these rigorous, just thoughtful people going at it. I kind of miss that in our in, in society, right? Yeah. Uh, we're, we're all too too trigger hungry for the right message that makes us feel the right emotion for an instant. Yeah, it's true. I think you can seek it out somewhere. I'm not quite sure where. And especially during COVID, it's just been, it's hard. Everybody's seeking that connection. Even if it's, there's friction around the connection, it's the human connection. There's, you can't replace it. So, okay. So you loved Princeton. Was that the right choice for you? I think absolutely. Yes. I think it's a magical place. Um, but I only have one data point, so yeah. it's hard to know, uh, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. Yeah. And when you were there studying mechanical and aerospace engineering, um, what did you kind of decide that you wanted to be when you grew up? Like how, what, what launched you into the real world? I loved, I've always loved real physical things, which comes back to the company Booster that, that I'm building right now. Um, but I, I knew that's where I was really good, something to do with logistical complexity and operations. And at the time, that meant navigating spacecraft design and building interplanetary spacecraft trajectories and all this fun stuff. Um, but I kind of wanted to cut my teeth in the real world. I had so many friends that were going into banking or consulting, and I kind of felt like, how can I how can I do management consulting if I've never done anything myself before? Like, let me go totally. and do something in the real world. Yeah. So you went to Boeing and you were working at spacecraft systems engineer. What does that even mean? Yeah, I mean, it means I was a small cog and a giant wheel building probably the most complicated school bus sized object that's ever been conceived. I mean, you know, something that had lasers on it and giant computers and had to operate um, six earth uh, diameters away from from the surface of the earth like just really cool oh complicated gosh. stuff really complicated i'm halfway like not even understanding what you're talking like halfway. i mean it was like, it basically huh? black magic uh the yeah. stuff that they do uh, at nasa at boeing at spacex it's almost black magic it seems like it. And so how were you able to balance that? And also for my research, it looks like you were going to Stanford at the same time. And like logistically, because Stanford's obviously in Palo Alto, were you in Seattle at Boeing? Yeah, no, I was at Boeing in California. Um, their okay. spacecraft is mainly in LA though. So there was a good amount of travel back and forth uh, from Northern California to Southern. 
Um, but I was also one of the first people to kind of pioneer with them a, a more remote focused type of uh, graduate education. And I felt so blessed. I felt like I was effectively getting 40 hours a week of real engineering lab work experience that I just happened to get paid for at Boeing while going to school. What a dream That's for incredible. an early, you know, early career engineer to kind of get the best of academic and real world at the same time. Yeah. And how do you even know what you're going to study? So you're at Stanford, it looks like you've got a master's in management science and engineering and aeronautics and astronautics. How, can you just like quickly, I'm not even sure who's listening to this podcast, but for <laughs> my, if my children are, or just for my uh, knowledge, tell me what the, the study of those various things means. Yeah. Um, like how do they yeah. even compare? It sounds like I just picked the longest titles for majors. Well, I'm like uh, aeronautics, astronautics. How do those differ even? Yeah, so aeronautics and astronautics, that's just the study of you know things that fly in air and things that fly in space, I think. Um, so they're basically. all, one of those words would be all encompassing for the other one? Yeah, like aeronautics, is, I think of airplanes. Okay. And astronautics, I think of space. Okay, good. I, I, that's where my gut went, but it's I like I was the like, Air I Force and the sure Space Force. This. Okay. Uh, Super and then, badass. And then management science and engineering. I mean, this, oh my gosh, if I, I wish we could reinvent the U.S. education system and focus on what I learned in management science. Tell me, because I need to know. Um, courses on decision, like how to make decisions, right? Think about getting to learn how you should make good decisions. That sounds like something we should all learn, probably before calculus. Absolutely. Um uh, probabilities, um, how to do manufacturing efficiently with supply chains. Um, but I think the most important thing to me was really how to make sound decisions and how to understand basic finance mm -hmm. are kind of lost on um, in our educational system, but feel really valuable. Yeah. Are there some nuggets you can share like in a concise way or is it too complex to even try to explain well, if, if there is a decision that comes to you right, right now, what principles do you apply to even like what lens are you looking through when you're making a decision right now? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, I might try to give three. Like one, one is don't let uncertainty phase you from making a good decision. So Shauna, I could, for instance, I could ask you, what's the temperature in Moscow, Russia right now? And you probably have no idea, right? But I could probably tell you without looking it up, hey, it's probably 20 degrees Fahrenheit plus or minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit with a 90% confidence bound. And I've just captured my level of uncertainty in a quantitative way that can actually really help me make good decisions without necessarily... Um, having to go do a bunch of research and study something. I think right. in business, so many times people get hung up because they don't have the perfect data and they're afraid to just guess. But to move fast, sometimes you just have to guess, but you have to find the middle ground where you, you know how big of a guess your guess is. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Right, it's an odds game. Like, what are the odds? Yes, yes. And then, and then there's a lot of beauty too in, in statistics around like, false positives and false negatives. And, you know, sometimes a medical test can be 99% accurate, but 85% of the time give the wrong result. And there are these weird, weird one-offs that I wish everybody could kind of get a dunking in and get a appreciation for how gray and complex a lot of science in the world is. Yeah. Wow. I, for some reason, my brain just went right to COVID, like all of the yeah. chaos right now around it, like false positives and how to the timing and how to test and what, what you're using as your data point and data sets and how you're comparing those things. Yeah, it's, it is pretty overwhelming right now. Yeah, it is very, very overwhelming. So you were on this path, you're at Stanford, you're at Boeing. Um, and at that point, you're thinking I'm going to be what when I grow up? I'm going to like my big picture of my life is is going to look like what? Yeah, I was I was one of those kids. I plotted it all out. I had the whole graph with the branches and the tree and the different options. Um, and and on that option list was being a mission specialist for NASA, going up to the International Space Station. Um, also on that list was being an entrepreneur at some point. And um, I didn't know which one would happen first, but I kind of, I kind of was drawn to those, 
those two paths early yeah. on. Had you had any entrepreneurial experiences as a kid? Like I've had several people on here who like kind of stumbled upon an entrepreneurial um, opportunity because they had an idea and it just was like kind of got some legs like yeah. without them even thinking. Other people did the plotting. Other people had like 10 different jobs yeah. be- before the age of like 16. Who are you yeah. in that whole entrepreneurial journey? Oh man, I, I wish I was the young kid that could just sell anything and and had a lemonade stand right and, and built it out. Yeah. I was the opposite of that. Um, are you an introvert or an extrovert? Introvert for sure. Um, and I was a boy scout growing up and the absolute least favorite thing was having to go door to door and sell Christmas wreaths. Yeah. Uh, just too painful. So I was not the natural born entrepreneur at all. But you have an extra, I'm guessing because of what you've chosen in your career, you know, just most of it being an introverted behavior. I mean, until you started Booster, but like um, anyone who's thinking I want to tinker and be in, in, the world that you were in would be probably an introvert, but you got an extroverted personality. Is that something that you've trained yourself for, or is it come more naturally because you just have to, as a CEO, be out there? I, I, I love this definition of introvert versus extrovert, which is where do you get your, where do you recharge? Yeah. Right. And I love talking to folks. I love sharing stories, but I get exhausted hanging out mm. at a party um yeah and it takes a lot of a lot of energy to to be in a crowd with people so um it's definitely not a natural zone yeah but um but one that definitely i think is important to to be in if you're going to be a leader in any any organization yeah have you read the book quiet i love that book it's oh. about it's about introverts um and just kind of how um sometimes introverts in a business setting could potentially be overlooked because they're not the one like speaking the loudest or kind of making their voice heard the most, but that yeah. they're oftentimes the best hires. Um, anyway, read the book. It's interesting. So you decided the entrepreneurial journey was probably, is that, is that what made you decide to go pursue an MBA at Harvard? Uh, almost. Like people who are listening who don't know you are probably like, well, what? <laughs> you did what? Yeah, I was like, what am I doing? Top business school. Degrees? No, it's not what are you doing? It's like, how do you get into all? I mean, how are you this well rounded and this smart and, and all of these areas? Because HBS specifically, I actually um, I, I have had a lot of people on the podcast that have gone to Harvard Business School, and I find that they seem to be the most um, kind of well rounded and also very good with like executive functioning and kind of just business savvy more than like, I'm going to nerd out and kind of be laser focused on one thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I was definitely on the nerd spectrum at HBS compared to my, my classmates. Um, and actually that was one of the draws was I wanted to go to a place where I was a little bit less comfortable mm. and out of my element and learn to get better at the other side of the coin. Yeah. Um, and it was a good chapter. What I had realized was back then, back in 2010, aerospace was a very slow industry. Um, SpaceX was probably on their Falcon one and, you know, had had a number of failures. Um, and I, I had been part of programs where spacecraft had blown up on a rocket and there, there goes five, six years of somebody's career, uh, in a moment. So I wanted to, I wanted to find something that was faster paced and that really took me to, to go back to school. Yeah. Was it comfortable for you as far as what you were learning? Um, you know, some of the case studies and, and I guess, has it prepared you well for your experience as, as the CEO of Booster? You know, I, I would say people recommend don't go to business school straight out of undergrad because you're not going to have the context for it to be valuable. I think it's also hard. I was an engineer going in and I didn't know a wink about how business worked at all, which uh, probably was a disservice in getting the most out of it. Um, But I do think like looking back, so much of business is fuzzy and nebulous and gray. Um, It definitely did a good job of giving you that rapid dunk, right? Giving you, try to give you five, eight years of, mess up experiences kind of baked all into a couple years. It's, it's, a, it's great for that. 
Yeah. And you got to ping pong back and forth between East Coast and West Coast a bunch. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what landed you um, out of HBS? Where did you go? Did you get recruited out? Yeah. So I almost went to a management consulting firm and um, I, man, that path, it's such a good path for folks out of uh, school because you get, you learn so much so quickly. Um, but I took this path less chosen. Um, I read a case study actually about the Jet Propulsion Lab, NASA's JPL lab. And in that case study was a protagonist who I knew was like a colleague of mine who was starting a new stealth startup, um, working on harvesting resources in deep space. So I just said, that's it. Like that sounds like the hardest, most complex, badass thing I could imagine. Life is short. If someone's willing to pay me to go do that, let's go do that. And that took me to Seattle where I worked out of Bellevue as one of the first employees building tiny prospecting spacecraft to go harvest resources in outer space. Wow, that was the planetary resources. Yes, yep, that's right, back yeah. in 2012. Yeah, interesting. So where did this idea come about for Booster? And it was Booster Fuels when I first met you years ago. Yeah. So there we got Booster, and, um, and how did you meet your co-founders? I always love, this is like the part of like why I even started the podcast. Yeah. is I was listening a lot to how I built this and just those early days of, you know, you meet someone and you're like, here you are, CEO of this great company, not realizing the origin story, like that very first. Yeah. I need to know all of that. Yeah. Part. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so how it worked for me was the first thing that happened was my boss, who's now my chairman, uh, actually, it was one of the best mentor boss things you could ever do. He said to me, Frank, I think you're ready to be a CEO. And, you know, that was either the nicest way somebody could fire somebody <laughs> um, or it really planted the seed in me that actually, given that I've had these years of experience working for this startup and I've seen the ups and downs um, and I'm at a stage in my life where I know what I don't know, but I'm not so tied down. I don't have three kids yet. Like I could actually do something. Yeah. Now's my moment. Now's my moment. I was 29. Um, and it got me into the mood of thinking, well, if I could do something, what would I do? And then, yeah, it was a, a rainy, I want to say Tuesday in August in Seattle on Capitol Hill, 2014. That was sad. It's not supposed to rain in August. I know. I know. Um, and my my wife, my wonderful wife was expecting our first baby girl, and she pulled me aside one day and she said, Frank, um, I've got a job for you. I'd like for you to be the chief fueling officer for the family because I never want to have to go to the darn gas station again. It smells, it's dirty, it's, it's a waste of time, and it's, it, you know, I don't like it. So I was doing this errand and just thinking, I don't know anybody who likes this. And this was the era of Uber growing up and people thinking Uber for X and on demand and mobile smartphones were just starting to become a thing. And it occurred to me, I could probably solve this problem using technology in a better way. That was the one idea I've ever had in my life that only got better over time to the point where I knew I would regret it if I didn't go and try to make it happen. Yeah. So, so the, the original idea was delivering gasoline to consumers. Yeah, the, the original idea was I want a consumer to park their car, push a button on an app, and basically get to walk away and go do whatever they're doing. And while they're gone, we're going to deliver fuel, and they're going to come back. Tank is full. They get to go on with life. They never have to deal with that errand again. And we still do that, by the way. We still do that for thousands of people every single day. And um... – yeah, I was talk actually telling my son, who's 17 and who will drive all the way to Costco in Issaquah from Mercer Island to get gas because he pays for his own gas. Yeah. And like the gas prices are so crazy. Are people benefiting on price when they use your service? Yeah, so this is probably the most magical constraint that has driven our business success from day one. And this goes back to my mother. I'm going to tie this to my mother. So she was the most hardworking and frugal person in my life. She would also drive five miles out of her way to save five cents a gallon. 
And so I knew I wanted to build a business where, you know, you can think of it as like an Amazon for energy. Let's imp- let's use data to improve supply chains and customer experience without raising price. Right. That was a goal. I needed to build a system that could make money while not charging people more. Which means it had to scale. It had to scale for sure. It had to scale. It had to completely rethink the supply chain. It had to focus our the markets and the density of where we go. It everything of the business was built around the simple idea that if I had to charge more for this, a lot of people would have second thoughts. Mm, but the yeah. moment you made it the same price and it's better, well, who want to do it? Yeah, they're like, right? what do I have to lose? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Everybody's always been, seeking efficiency and time saving for sure. That was the holy grail that really set the rocket ship up. Yeah. Interesting. And, and what's yeah. what was the business model? And what is the business model now? Or what's the business now? How is it different? Yeah. So the, the business started the beachhead market, I would say, where we proved out this opportunity was servicing employees at corporate campuses. Mm. So we went to companies like um, Cisco and Facebook um, and PayPal, and we asked their employee benefits people, hey, what, what would you think if we could offer people clean, in some cases, renewable, low carbon fuel delivered directly to their cars while they work? That way, uh, they can be happier employees, retention will go up, traffic will go down, emissions will go down. And a lot of companies were saying, absolutely, yes, let's do it. So we would do that. And then we would open up at these corporate campuses and serve them, serve their vehicles all day long. That was the business model. Um, You'd open our app. You can look at our app. You can download our app today and look at all the great reviews. People love this idea. We call it park, push, and pop. Park your car, mm-hmm. you love push it. the button, and then you, you just pop that door, the fuel door open and lock your car. That's all you have to do. It's easier than ordering an Uber or Lyft, and it just works. How so much do you, do you come and like the thing's not popped? Very rarely. So there's a lot of UI, UX in the design to remind people to educate okay. them and yeah. make sure they're doing the right thing to, to set you up in the right way. So that's how it started and and where it's really grown, particularly during these last two years with the pandemic is, well, think about the economy, delivery of everything. Fleet vehicles have replaced our own personal driving. You're now ordering more online, getting it delivered. So our core business now is actually at night providing the energy management and energy fuel for all of the vehicles that deliver packages and mow your lawn and deliver school children to to school, fire trucks, ambulances. We fuel them um, often with 100% low carbon renewables so they can get their job done. Wow, it's incredible. It's a win, win, win across the board. We like to call it the an easy button to go sustainable. Um, oh yeah! These companies they get to start their day ready to go. Um, you can imagine with labor shortages as they are, they want their people delivering fifteen extra packages, not going to the gas station. Right. Because we use data and we have a direct supply chain. Instead of using fossil fuels, they can get access to clean renewables, and we make it all happen seamlessly with peace of mind. Oh, I love that this this little pivot kind of happens organically and that it just opens up such an incredible opportunity and um, puts you in a position to be in a mission-driven company where you can really leave a mark, like in a big, yes. huge way faster, which is amazing. So how did you even meet? Um, I want to go back again to those early days. We're talking Capitol Hill. It's raining. It's August. You've got this idea. You're taking over the fuel and you have your aha moment, where were the gaps? Because you've got your skill set and then you need to fill that in for somebody yeah. to go build out the technology. Where do Tyler and Diego come into this? And then also, how'd you come up with the name? Yeah, yeah. So, so they came in pretty early on. Um, I knew that I wasn't going to be the one developing the app and I needed a strong technical co-founder. And I also needed somebody who was a magical ideas and action kind, kind of complement to 
I like to say I like to grow the pie big and my co-founder Tyler likes to make sure that we keep some of the pie for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, I So Diego, I had actually worked with several years before at my very first startup, a company called New Space Global. And he was the hardest working, most empathetic, most sincere and brilliant engineer I'd ever met. So the story goes, the moment that we raised the first capital, I was in Texas um, and I, I told Diego I wanted him to come join. Well, he lived in LA, but was at a conference in New York and he didn't even go home. He just changed his flight, oh. uh, joined me in Texas and worked out of a suitcase for six weeks. Oh, that's the coolest. You said you just raised your first funds. So you by yourself went out and raised or who did you raise from? Is this angels? Is this VC? Yeah. So our first we, a number of angels, but the first two big investors were Madrona Venture Group out there who, who you know well and uh, Ross Perot Jr. Oh. And, and his fund out in Texas. So they came together. R Ross Perot really was a visionary who I got to meet who was building an incubator. It's now a wonderful incubator out in Fort Worth, Texas. And so in his Texan accent, he invited me to say, hey, Frank, imagine if you could work out of my offices, live out of my uh, apartments, park your vehicles off of my airport land. I remember this, actually. I do remember this story. Yeah. Yeah. I had forgotten this. That's incredible. And did these, did these investors get it? Or did you really have to explain that? Like, what type of proof of concept were they looking for to say he's onto something like repeat customers? Like what? Like So this is so important. So, cause I think most people would say, Hey, you're trying to build Uber for X, like go build the app first and, and then show that to investors, blah, blah, blah. We raised this money. I think the app was basically a napkin sketch. And, and I, I like to tell a lot of people, when you've got a great idea, I think you've got to do two things to, to raise capital. The first is you really got to build out the steps. Think, think hard about if I raise this money, what milestones can I achieve with this money to make the company more valuable? Right. And talk in terms of how you're going to go de-risk and achieve those milestones. And the second thing is, Figure out the riskiest part of your business, the most wild assumptions that have to be true, and go prove those first. So that's really what we did. Investors were looking for the fact that we had a path from a regulatory perspective to do this, that we had letters of intent from customers that wanted it, and that we had a game plan to show product market fit. That was really it in a really big TAM. Yeah. And so... Um... How much have you raised to date? It's about a hundred million dollars. Oh my goodness. A pretty sobering number. Yeah. Yes. Is it scary for you to take people's money? Like, I know it's a weird question, but um, I feel like I would be bad. Yeah. At, like, I bootstrapped my company because I'd be like, oh, well, no, I'm a people pleaser. I would be worried that, I, I mean, I know it's VC. They're used to it. They, they're, they're looking for like <laughs> one in 10, one in 20, you know, they're fine oh. with it. But um, also the key, and I know that you like to mentor people, and I don't know who's listening, but if it's an entrepreneur, I think another key point is that not to just take any money. Like there's yeah. smart money. There's people who are going to be in it with you through the good, the bad. And there's some yeah. who are just like going to give you the wrong message of like kind of going against where your own personal goals are for the company. So how did you choose the investors and what was that fundraising process like for you? Yeah. So I, so it's definitely scary and, uh, to raise money from other people for me, uh, you know, you raise around it's to me, it's not a celebratory moment. It's a time of, um, reflection and being pensive and ooh, the weight on your shoulders just got more heavy. Yeah. It's not for right. everybody. Uh, so you want to find, you want to find partners that like Madrona, I like they're saying day one through the long run that are patient, wise partners that have seen this play out and are going to have conviction through thick and thin. Mm -hmm. um, I also, when you know the early money coming together, there is a bit of this dynamic of you, people naturally are going to be fearful of something brand new. Right. You're disrupting right. a whole space. It's never been disrupted. You have to find a way to shift that fear. Greed is a wrong word, but like shift, shift, people's mindset from fear to opportunity, mm -hmm. right? 
And I sometimes joke the best way to do that is not try to get the best term sheet you possibly can, but get something that is so real that everybody knows the train is leaving the station. That you're gonna that you're gonna this is gonna happen. You've got the willpower and the conviction and the partners that you're unstoppable. And once you get there, rounds come together. Yeah. Uh, particularly in the seed stage, it's it's about showing that you've got the plan and the train is about to leave the station. Yeah, and that you're gonna miss out if you don't get on board. That's right. That's on right. board the train. So I read, and I don't know if this is accurate because things change like literally daily, but it's something like you've saved more than 8 million miles and 4 million pounds of CO2 emissions. How are you measuring that? And I guess when you started the company, did you intend on, was this part of your plan that this is going to be a mission-driven company? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we were customer obsessed first and foremost, which meant we started Booster to solve a customer problem, which was, I want my time back and I don't like this errand we really lucked into this massive opportunity to also, I believe, do more to decarbonize last mile transportation than nearly any other company. And the story there's a really important one. Um, there are phenomenal ways to, so we'll take a fleet, a, a fire engine, an ambulance, and on a Monday, they might be running on dirty fossil fuels. And with Booster, they can be running on 100% plant-based renewables. Uh, and we're expanding into EV2. But it can happen wow. that quickly. It can happen overnight with no, no expensive modifications to facilities and million-dollar plans over many years. That flip being easy is the gateway to making decarbonization happen really quickly. So that's what we do is, is we take these big fleets um, – and in many places, if you're getting your lawn mowed or you're getting packages delivered, there's a good chance that that's being done on 100% renewables today with less than a third of the carbon intensity of traditional fossil fuels because of what we've built. That's incredible. It's, that's incredible. it's pretty amazing. How has it been for you attracting talent? Is that is that part of the story um, help close. I mean, I know there's this whole like, you know, quote unquote, and it's real because we're busier than ever, like this war on talent and we're up against companies like you are up against, you know, the big guys. Yeah. Um, does that help being like, hey, we've got this vision, obviously incredible founding team, but people want to have meaning in their jobs yeah. these days. I've been blown away, Shauna, at the the level of the number of amazing, incredible people that want to do something in the real world, that want to be able to roll up their sleeves and have an impact they can see in the real society that they live in, right? Um, you know, I, I joke that atoms are a lot harder than bits these days in many business models, but we live in an atom-based world and the world needs entrepreneurs solving great atom-related problems with technology. Um, and I get to be this entrepreneur and this company where it's like every little kid's dream. We get to play with little trucks going around. <laughs> um, uh, My brother made me play with trucks growing up. Yes, it's true. <laughs> it is every every kid's dream. That's so funny. Right? I mean, it's uh, – so there's definitely – it's not for everybody, but there's a certain personality type that is willing to make the sacrifices and take the risks and join yeah. a company like ours. Um, and that's been that's been great. And um, as far as your values, not your personal values, but the company values, um, at what stage of developing this company did you realize that those are important to establish and have they stayed consistent? Um, yeah. And if so, how do you kind of lead into them as a CEO, especially with many of us working remotely right now, like kind of keeping that core culture of values? Yeah. Yeah. I think the first answer as to when they become important is, I don't know what the, the sociological words are, but when you get from like a, a group size or a family size to a tribe size, right? Mm. And when you can't all be in the same room every single week, I think that's when communicating and writing down values becomes really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, our, our values have stayed fairly, they've stayed consistent. The words we use to describe them 
have evolved a bit over time. Um, I think the most important thing though, as you get larger, is to use the vernacular of the values in everyday meetings. Mm, that's important, yeah, interesting. And then are you using those when you're recruiting? Like, are you measuring against the values? And if so, I, I mean, I've been doing recruiting for 27 years and I haven't solved this yet. I'm just curious how you screen out and make sure that somebody's going to add a lot to your culture. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I do believe a great value is one that you can performance manage and recruit against. Um, if it's something that's more blase and a general truth, it's, it's not giving you that power, right? To answer your question on recruiting more specifically, I had a mentor that did more for me in 48 hours about how I recruit than anybody else. Um, and I'll share just a snippet of this because he he pulled me out, I want to say somewhere like Phoenix, Arizona, like had me fly out just for this intensive like one day one-on-one -on -one with him. And the most brilliant thing that he told me was if you when you're recruiting, start from the end. Think about statistically, why do employees not work out? And when you look at the data, it turns out that it's not technical competence that is why people don't work out. It tends to be four other things first, which are coachability, emotional intelligence, motivation, and temperament. And so we just dug into this about, okay, what do those words mean? And then the even harder part about how do you actually test for these things? That is the tough part. So do you have, tell me. Well, obviously you can't just ask somebody, hey, are you coachable? Right. Or right. like, tell me about your temperament. Yeah, it's hard. But I think you can, you can, you can figure it out through questions that put people in scenarios and their past and and try to get them to reflect and, and how they answer stories and attribute things. So there's a whole bunch of effort there that I think also coincides with going really deep on one thing. Mm. Um, because people who do things, it gets seared in their brain, like imprinted, right? Versus like you just participated or you kind of pretended like you did it. So finding one thing to go really deep, I also think is really important if you want to truly find talent that that rolls up their sleeves yeah you'll have to send me this stuff i'm yeah, fascinated I i'm always looking for little hacks of ways to get better and train my team to be better and, and even just share with our clients because everybody's so always, hard. we get called on this like all the time i also i'm just super curious about some of your more recent strategic partnerships yeah in business yeah um well we we announced in, I want to say, just a month and a half ago, a strategic partnership with Renewable Energy Group. And Shauna, there doesn't get to be a better story than this. Like we, what we're doing, the whole world of renewables, clean renewables is missing and lacking distribution, right? Uh, you know, think about yourself in Seattle. If I were to ask you, hey, go and put renewable fuel into your vehicle, where would you go, right? Yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. I'd call you and be like, what do I do now? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you should. I mean, the, the problem for many fleet companies, the biggest fleets in the world has been, even if they wanted to go renewable, what are their options? And what are the efficient options? Well, we realized we solved that problem. So we partnered with this, this public company, Renewable Energy Group, and they're now an investor to really become, uh, you know, effectively get this incredible product to vehicles every single night across the country and and it's working so we announced in december that fully half of our customers that used to run on um conventional diesels were now on 100 percent plant-based products we went we got to most customers within the first four weeks of the program that's incredible just getting started, just getting started. So it's it's a journey and, and we'll get them to EV too. We're, we're gearing up for that chapter, but I'm a big believer too in, in building a business. You got to take baby steps. 
Wow. The coolest part ever, I have to say about my job and having started this, my company, and, you know, we started 2013, so like a little right before you, yeah. um, is meeting these amazing entrepreneurs like you and especially seeing success like yours. I just feel like, talk about being on a rocket ship. Like you're just, you're just flying. It's so cool to see, like seriously, and doing good. Like you can do well and do good. So cliche, but it's when companies are doing that, it's just, it's such, such a good example for our kids. And I'm, I'm just so grateful to you. It's awesome. How are you balancing it all? Like you've got the three kids, you've got the business, you've got your seven minute workout. What do you do to just chill out and relax and decompress? Yeah. Uh, I've got this mental image of the duck where it's smooth on the top, but yeah. you're, you're paddling. Um, you know, my weird guilty pleasure is actually watching competitive StarCraft, oh. which is a, it's a video game, um, but it's, it's just very intellectually stimulating. And I think you can learn a lot from business about this, um, from this game and how it works. Uh, that's my random thing that I do. That's awesome. With the kids or the family. And the kids are, um, remind me their ages and then are any of them like mini me's? Do you have any little mini Frank juniors? Like as far as like the future astronaut or scientist, not YouTuber? Yeah, 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 yeah. We, Hopefully, we both God, have three God kids, willing. Right? Uh, <laughs> yes. It's amazing how different kids are from each other and even their parents, I think. Um, they're seven, five and a newborn. Um, and, you know, they definitely have some of my intensity, uh, but I think they're going to be their own people, which is a great thing. Yeah. yeah. Is your wife the, the yin to your yang? Absolutely. She's yeah. a hero. Um, I would say she's the extro extrovert to my introvert. Um, but, you know, the, these entrepreneurial journeys, they take a lot from everybody. They're, they're a lot. Well, it's a whole family thing. And I think people don't realize that part. everybody's making a sacrifice of time of, I mean, potential resources and income at certain moments, just even just yeah. the, men, the mental health of just like what it's like to, to go through what you go through in a day and the highs and the lows of running a company. It's, it's definitely intense. So what's your ultimate fuel? What fuels you? I, well, uh, let me let me answer that with with family, but uh, with a framing that totally transformed me and my mental attitude about being an entrepreneur. I think I think a lot of entrepreneurs, it's such hard work. It's a hundred hour weeks, and you're cranking away, and it's it's got ups and downs, and it's very easy to feel like, hey, family, I'm doing this all this hard work for you, right? And get into this mode of exhaustion. I think entrepreneurs have to flip that. And make sure that you're realizing your family is giving you permission to go do this crazy thing. I love it. You know, and if you can do that flip, it that's the fuel for me is is a, is when you can get that family engine to all be like just mutually grateful and working together. It's a pretty special thing. 